morning. You guys can hear me in the back home. Calvin gave a thumbs up. So. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Raymond Gaba. I'm one of the uh, uh, new attendees. I work in the PR and I work in the Nikki and the Sikhi of Kingston. Uh, the topic we'll be discussing today is about uh, precedents. And I hope that by the end of this, we'll all be precedent experts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I right, just hover the mouse. Like this so we often use uh, you know, sedative agents in the CCT, a downstate, or you're rotating up in the ICU, any of the ICUs, the NICU, neuro ICU, or surgical ICU. And these are probably the most common ones that we're very familiar with propofol, ketamine, fentanyl, Merced, and Presidex. So, the one I'd like to discuss is Presidex. And the objectives are to briefly just go over the pharmacology, physiology, clinical uses, and some of the evidence behind uh, its use. Uh, and specifically, I'd like to go over its use in both intubated patients and non-intubated patients. So dexmedetomidine is the uh, diagram of the molecular structure right next to its close cousin, clonidine. Um, these are both alpha-2 agonists. And there's been research into alpha-2 agonists dating back to the 60s. Um, dexmedetomidine uh, is an enantiomer of metatomidine, which is used in veterinary medicine. Uh, it was FDA approved in 1999, uh, initially for sedation and mechanically ventilated patients in the ICU. Uh, initially, up to 24 hours, there was concern about withdrawal for more prolonged uh, sedation. And then in 2008, it was FDA approved for procedural sedation in non patients. So alpha-2 agonists. So on the left, you see there's a diagram of a synapse and a synaptic left in the alpha-2 receptor. And it shows where dexmedetomidine slash Presidex binds and leads to a negative feedback loop and decreases release of norepinephrine into the synaptic left. And where these receptors are located in the body dictates essentially the overall effect of the medication. So for example, in the central nervous system, in the supraspinal area, in the uh, upper spinal cord, locus cervelli, uh, alpha-2 uh, receptor agonism leads to sedation and analgesia. Its effects on the heart can lead to bradycardia. Its effects on the peripheral vascular system can lead to decreased vasoconstriction and vasodilation, so it can lead to hypertension. It can also have an anti-shivering effect, and it can also lead to some diuresis. So if you can imagine, if this is the physiological effect based off of its pharmacology, you can imagine this is where we derive its clinical use. Um, a key fact about Presidex is that patients that are sedated with Presidex tend to be much more arousable than other sedatives. Uh, they're described as sleepy, but arousable, they're very interactive, and importantly, they have minimal to no respiratory depression, which is a key feature and advantage of dexmedetomidine. Uh, the onset of sedation takes about 15 minutes, and it peaks at about an hour. It's an elimination half-life, about three hours. It's cleared by the liver, and so patients that have liver disease may want to use a little bit of a lower dose, maybe start with half dose. So just to go over the pharmacology and physiology, it's a selective alpha-2 agonist. It's about seven to eight times more selective for the alpha-2 receptor than clonidine. It leads to sympatholysis, analgesia. It's opioid sparing. So patients that are requiring multiple sedatives, you may be able to decrease the dose of opioid, which is always a good thing. And it leads to sedation. And patients are much more arousable and they're interactive. And again, the key factor to recognize is that it's the minimal respiratory depression. There are some limitations, and again, this derives from its physiological effect, and that it leads to bradycardia, hypotension, and it's not great for achieving deep sedation. So if you're trying to get somebody completely relaxed and passive, passive may not be the drug of choice to achieve that target of sedation. 
So one final slide just to go over the clinical benefits of precedent, short-term sedation, the ICU, and procedural sedation. It reduces the need for rescue sedation with propofol and dadalan, other common agents that are typically used. You'll tend to decrease the dose of opioids that the patients are getting. And they're easy to arouse. These patients are interactive. Um, they can communicate and they can interact in their own care. It's very well tolerated and again, not associated with respiratory depression. And its main limitation, the main factors that have to be monitored are bradycardia and hypotension. So how do we use it? How do we clinically now take this pharmacology, this physiology, these main advantages and disadvantages and apply it to the bedside? Well, this is literally taken from what would uh, potentially be an epic order set. Uh, main starting dose is 0.2 mics per kg per hour. Uh, the titration range is 0.2 to 1.5. Now, initially, it was approved for about half of those. The 1999 FDA approval was for up to 0 0.7, 0 0.8. But later studies showed that much higher doses were well tolerated. Uh, but going higher than 1.5, 1.6 only really resulted in adverse effects without any further sedation. The titration target, this is a key uh, uh, fact, the key uh, factor that we need to consider when we use these medications is that you have to have a titration target. What are you trying to achieve with these medications? So we use the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, the RAS um, scale. And typically, a target of negative one to negative two is light, sleepy sedation. Zero, they're awake, they're cooperative, they're able to interact a little bit deeper than that. Um, and every 10 to 30 minutes, 20 minutes or so, you can titrate it up to that effect uh, until you achieve that target level of sedation that you're trying to achieve by 0.1 mics per kg per hour. Once your target is reached, you reassess the patient every hour or so um, and take it from there. So this is an example of the RAS score, and really any patient that's on continuous sedation in the form of an infusion should have their sedation scale assessed. This is just a common one. There are others, but this is the one who's pink scanning. Um, and again, positive numbers correspond to agitation and stimulation, while more negative numbers correspond to going all the way down to general anesthesia and negative numbers. We want to keep our patients alert and calm, maybe a little bit sleepy so that they can tolerate their care. So how do we deal with potential adverse effects? The, more co the most common adverse effect that we're expected to achieve or expected to uh, see counter are bradycardia and hypertension. So if a patient develops bradycardia or hypertension, you essentially hold an infusion and you wait for their heart rate to recover and their blood pressure to improve, and then you restart the infusion if you still need further sedation and you're choosing to continue the precedence, but after prior. So we've discussed the pharmacology, the physiology, how to start it in terms of dosages, ranges, and what scale to use, what target. What are the clinical uses? So the common clinical uses are sedation in the intubated patient, sedation in the non-intubated patient, delirium and withdrawal management, I would say as an adjunct, not as a primary medication, multimodal analgesia slash procedural sedation. And I'd say probably more on the side of multimodal analgesia, not so much in procedural sedation, and post-cardiac arrest shivering management, which all makes sense if you think about the physiological effects of the medication itself. So, where does the evidence stand in terms of precedent use? So, Society of Critical Care Medicine puts out these guidelines called the PADIS guidelines. It stands for pain, agitation, delirium, immobility, and sleep disruption. And they put out these guidelines in 2018. Before that, 2013, it was just PAD, pain, agitation. And they essentially review all the available literature, the highest quality literature whatever quality literature is found on a specific topic related to IC sedation. And in it, they review a lot of the literature related to all the different sedative agents, opioids, uh, benzodiazepines, propofol, Presidex, ketamine, and how to apply them to patients that are experiencing pain, agitation slash delirium, um, and 
the assistance with achieving uh, 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 circadian rhythm in the ICU. So what do they have to say about Presidex? Presidex and propofol are generally preferred over benzodiazepines, and the reasoning really is because of increased rates of delirium, specifically in ICU, uh, and shorter lengths of stay in the ICU, and shorter uh, uh, durations of mechanical ventilation, i.e. earlier uh, time to excavation. So here's one example of a study, uh, the CETCOM trial, largely drives the recommendations for our state in 2018. Uh, and it's a study of dexmedetomidine versus midazolam for sedation patients that are intubated. And the two, the two graphs, the figures on the left, essentially show that with precedex, there's a lower rate of delirium compared to midazolam in ICU patients that and on the right, that there's an earlier uh, extubation in patients that are used, that are sedated with dexamethamine compared to midazolam. Here's another trial, it's called the Dahlia trial. It shows essentially that dexamethamine helps patients get extubated earlier. So for example, a lot of times we encounter patients that are delirious and that makes, makes it challenging to extubate them. Uh, for fear that afterwards the delirium will require reintubation. And so starting them on an infusion of dexmedetomidine uh, allows us to extubate them and keep the dexmedetomidine uh, infusion going as well with either non-invasive or even on just uh, nasal cannula space. So should we routinely just use Presidex uh, for intubated patients? And this is a trial from 2019 um, that studies the use of dexmedetomidine as the sole agent. So for patients that have just been intubated early on without anything else compared to usual care with propofol, midazolam, or multimodal uh, agents. So you think I'm trying to pitch the, uh, that Presidex is a good medication, but maybe we should use it as a first line drug for to pick patients early on. And it turns out that Maybe that's not the best idea, uh, especially in patients that we're trying to achieve deep sedation, which tends to occur early on in the acute phase. So while there is a role for precedence as part of the regimen, perhaps on day two, and in some patients on day one, using it routinely may not be the best fit. You have to assess the patient, see what the patient's individual sedation needs are, and then target that uh, uh, sedation target uh, using medications such as precedence, but you may need to add something else. So in this trial, for example, using dexamethamine uh, led to an increase in uh, adjunct medications such as Versed and propofol. And actually there were more adverse effects just starting with precedence compared to propofol Versed. The adverse effects were of course bradycardia and hypertension, but actually a couple episodes of cases really requiring C very small rate, but significant compared to the other group. So I think what this says is, and by the way, the number needed to harm for all adverse effects is equal to three, the number needed to harm for episode of six is still 167. Uh, but if you are starting out with a patient who's initially intubated with respiratory failure, chances are you're going to do something a little bit more than this. So what about in non-intubated patients? So we do non-invasive ventilation all the time. We do it for COPD patients. We do it for cardiogenic shock, flash pulmonary edema. As a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we do it for pneumonia and immunocompromised patients. We do it sometimes for asthma patients. We do it for some neuromuscular patients. In the ICU, we excavate patients to bypass when they're a little bit high risk. We want to remove them from invasive ventilation, but they still need some mechanical support. So what about the cat food patients? And I have to make mention of uh, Dr. Satoshi's recent paper, also uh, mentioning potentially the benefit of uh, uh, using uh, non-invasive ventilation in COVID-19 versus going straight to intubation, and that doing a trial with non-invasive ventilation and intubating afterwards may not be worse than just going at the so I think maybe we'll be seeing more on basic ventilation in 2019. And I think we do more now than we did back in March and April. So we can add that to our group. So 
This is actually a trial, a systematic review of meta analysis from this year. It came out in chest, but it's going to come out in chest. Um, that looked at Presidex in non invasive ventilation uh, compared to uh, placebo and showed that, and other medications such as and showed uh, a decreased rate of intubation in group patients that got uh, Presidex. Uh, and really, the benefit is that Presidex seems to allow for better tolerance. So what did we see over the past year? If you start a patient on non-invasive ventilation and they're not able to tolerate it, but they really need it and that mask falls off, you run into big trouble. So here's potentially a potential solution to that issue of non-invasive intolerance. And why do they not tolerate it? I mean, think about it. These patients are dyspneic, um, they have respiratory failure, and we come at them with essentially a face mask interface that is extraordinarily claustrophobic um, and um, it's suffocating. And in order to achieve some element of comfort and tolerance and compliance and experience with that therapy, there's a role for some sedation. Uh, by the way, this was a mix of med surge patients, so both surgical IC patients and medical IC patients. Um, we looked at about 10 to 12 studies, uh, RCTs. Obviously, there were a couple RCTs that drove the benefit. Uh, this forest plot. So that's just one systematic review from this year. But there's a lot of different trials that look at precedents in non patients compared to other agents like Zadlan or placebo. I think that's something to find better, including in one chest trial. So this is a nice little paper that looks at all the agents, or the most commonly used agents that we utilize, and looks at their uh, pharmacological profiles. So hemodynamic stability, analgesia, amnesia, ankylosis. PVD stands for uh, preservation of ventilatory drive. Uh, avoidance of post-op not involving maybe not so relevant to us. Promotion of natural sleep. Uh, suitability for use after activation. And the higher the number is the more uh, beneficial the uh, uh, parameters for that specific medication. So it's a protocol that has an opioids, dexmedetomidine, and so if you look at the table, you can see that dexmedetomidine takes the lead when it comes to uh, most ideal out of the choices for sedation and non-invasive ventilation. Ketamine follows very closely, but there's a lot more evidence for dexmedetomidine. So Similar to the story, similar to the question about using Presidex routinely for intubated patients, you may ask, well, should we go ahead and use Presidex routinely for all patients that initiate non-invasive And the answer to that is also we shouldn't do anything routinely without uh, doing the assessment first. Uh, so this is a trial where they actually did that. They just started patients on non-invasive ventilation because they had an indication for non-invasive ventilation, and then simultaneously started them also on Presidex. Um, and so this was independent of them having a NIV non-invasive ventilation tolerance or, or not. So you can imagine they just had uh, more uh, episodes of deeper sedation. Um, and so really, I think what this tells us is not everyone that uh, gets non-invasive ventilation has a problem with uh, tolerating it. Uh, some patients do. And out of the patients that have problems tolerating non-invasive ventilation, that's the subset that may benefit from adding sedative. And of the choices of sedative, uh, Presidex seems to be a good choice. So how do we make a decision? In the end, we have a patient where either intubating or we're managing the non-invasive ventilation. So we have to look at our EVM three pillars. We have to look at the best scientific evidence. We have to look at our collective clinical experience. Or we have to consider our patient health. So when we look at patient values, we want to ensure that our patients that are suffering from acute critical illness, that we're listening to them, that we're ensuring that they're as comfortable as possible when they're going through um, a respiratory failure and distress, and we're performing painful procedures. We want to use our clinical experience, and I can tell you that we have a lot of experience using precedent in non-invasive ventilation uh, and in intubated patients as part of a multimodal sedation regimen. And from a best scientific evidence, it seems like there is uh, a low to moderate quality uh, body of literature that supports the use of precedents in non-invasive ventilation and definitely in invasive ventilation. 
And so when we put all of those together, the right hand side uh, of the screen gives us at least a, a, an approach to tackling these patients. So what we have to start with is we have a patient on non-invasive ventilation. Um, we try to identify what the trigger is for the discomfort. What's the cause? Is there a problem with the mask, the mask interface? Are they in pain? Are they delirious? Are they in distress? Do they not have enough oxygen or enough pee? Uh, and we try to reverse any potential reversible issue. Um, and if there is nothing reversible, we can still try non-pharmacological means like coaching the patient. And if that's not enough, then we can move on to uh, applying sedative medications. And I think that a first line choice would be precedent. Um, with that said, um, here are my references, the main references that I use for this talk. And I will take questions. Um, Christine, I don't know if you saw this. Any, any preference between ketamine and Presidex for sedation of acidotic patients who are intubated? For acidotic patients that are intubated, is there any preference for Presidex or for ketamine? Well, it seems like the question is, is there any preference for sedation period? From a uh, respiratory drive perspective, if the patient is spontaneously breathing, in other words, if we allow the patient to compensate, we put them on a spontaneous mode. Uh, if they're intubated and we're presumably uh, ventilating them for order to compensate, there shouldn't be a difference. They both maintain respiratory. Ketamine has a little bit more bronchial test, more bronchial dilation. If it's an asthma patient, for example, there's more bronchial dilation. Um, it can cause uh, bronchial to clear secretions. Uh, Presidex doesn't have that. Um, I think there's more data for Presidex as part of a more kind of general sedation regimen, but there's uh, obviously some ketamine in asthma specific. Um, questions, Rob? Yeah. Um, I said two part question. So, like, say, like, you're like the ICU doctor. So, like, talking to the ED. So, I guess, what is the ideal patient um, where we should consider about starting the ED? So, I guess, for one, would be the intubated patient. I can, can I can see scenarios where you would want them to have a mental status and scenarios where you wouldn't. So, I guess, like, maybe a neuro patient, if you want to do a physical exam, is that a patient? And the second question, I guess, based off of that, I would guess what's the onset is, uh, is one, of, one of the reasons why the early station of Presidex failed because they, the onset wasn't fast enough or they weren't deep enough or a lot. Of, so to answer the first part is it depends on why you intubated the patient. So the way I approach it is, is like an A, B, C, D, E, F. Or so why we intubate because that's going to dictate how you ventilate and your difficulty in ventilating the patient is going to dictate how deep we should sedate. Not all patients are, are, not all clinical problems are created equally. And I can tell you that respiratory failure, so asthma, COPD, ARDS, anything, any problem with the lungs that is so sick that you've intubated them, it's going to be pretty uh, difficult to sedate them solely with presence. With that said, patients that are intubated, let's say for solely a, an airway problem, uh, angioedema, it's not uncommon that they get deeply sedated in order to facilitate the patient be in the OR. And then once they get to the ICU, very quickly press it because their mental status is okay, their lungs are okay, and the airway occlusion is bypassed with EP. If they can tolerate a light level of sedation, that's fantastic. Some of those patients don't need any sedation. And we sit them up, let them watch TV until the swelling goes down, and try to extubate them as safely as possible. Another group of patients is the narrow patients. So, if you think about it, with the exception of status epilepticus, a lot of neuro patients that get intubated for either spontaneous ICH, uh, severe traumatic brain injury, their mental status is telling you, I think I should intubate this patient. So they're so, it's as if they're auto sedated, right? You're saying I have to intubate this patient for airway protection. That patient, if you remove the blood pressure goal and uh, we're not talking about status epilepticus, but the second thing, they may need very, very light sedation, if any sedation at all, because you've intubated them for airway protection. They're sleepy already, in general. Obviously, that's a simplification. So that's a good population you could apply precedent. Very light sedation for analgesia, for sedation, just to tolerate all the procedures and critical care. The status epilepticus, obviously, is separate because they require benzos to treat the underlying uh, illness. 
The last uh, example is uh, sepsis, septic septic shock. If it's due to a pulmonary issue, that's in the respiratory failure uh, category. If it's due to something that's like that use, pyelo, um, uh, bacteremia, endocarditis, uh, managing the ventilator may boil down to managing acidosis. If they have a high lactate. If the lungs are okay. The airway presumably may not be a different airway, maybe stretch cord. So their vent management may be okay. That group may also require pretty light sedation. You, you, in fact, you want to be cautious with the sedation because they're hemodynamically unstable. So you're going to have to respond to your sedation with vasoactive medication. So you just kind of have to balance that. So Presidex, I think, is very good for non-invasive ventilation if the patient needs it. And I think it's good for that light sedation. Respiratory failure, problems with the lungs, on day two, once you're seeing that the patient is getting better, I think it's very good as a sole agent. And very rarely in some patients feel on day one, but you really have to see what their what their sedation needs are. In terms of the onset of action, think about 15 minutes to about half an hour, 45 minutes will peak. And so you're right. If you intubate someone and you sucks, within 10 minutes or so, that paralytic wears off. And if you use the comedate or ketamine, you've got 10, 15 minutes for that whole deal. Once, that medic, once those two meds wear off, patient successfully intubated, and you know we're doing all of our other stuff, we're setting up the ventilator, that's when you start to hear the alarms go off, right? Once the paralytics wear off. If you use rocuronium, that's going to be 45 minutes. Once those paralytics wear off, either 15 or 45 minutes, the alarms start to go off. If it's an asthma patient, it's auto -pain. If it's an ARDS patient, the pressure is going And so then we start running back and forth with, okay, let's get some propofol, let's get some fentanyl. Presidex, I don't think we'll cut it in those two scenarios. Uh, all right, we'll do two more questions. Uh, Trevor uh, asked, uh, in a, I guess, hypotension, bradycardia preference for propofol versus Presidex, or would you avoid both and use benzos until more hemodynamically stable? So I wouldn't use Presidex if the patient's already bradycardic, or if they have a high degree of E block, or any risk for bradycardia. Um, if the patient is septic, and hypotensive, and they're getting pressure, you can use any of the medications. Um, of course, you're going to have to just respond to the addition of the sedative. You may want to use a lower dose of sedative if the person is uh, hypotensive. You could use Versed. So just to be clear, Versed is kind of, you know, it's it's uh, it's uh, sort of a deliriogenic med. You, know, you don't want to use it for very long periods. If you're expecting to use it for a short period of time, that's not the end of the world. Tendency is going to be to try to transition it to anything else but Versed. Some patients will need Versed, and, and, and that's okay. But as long as you have a, a rational approach of saying, hey, you know, this person is hemodynamically stable, uh, they're very hard, I'm not going to use precedence in these patients. They're hypotensive, I could use uh, boluses. You don't have to do infusions of fentanyl um, or propofol, and make sure I'm being cautious with what it does to the blood pressure and I'm responding to you. Um, and then the last question, what doses have you generally used for agitated patients on BiPAP for compliance with success? The full range, so 0.2 to 1.5 and um, for dates, so several days. And you just, if someone becomes more normal upstairs, if they're on it for a few days, then you could actually get the flow. And so you, one, one thing that we do upstairs is we uh, switch them to quantity. Uh, which is essentially the PO version of uh, an alpha 2 agonist, um, and try to titrate them off of that once they're looking like they're getting ready to move out of the ICG for a step down or medical. Uh, but 0.2 to 1.5. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you, Dr.